We're live. We're live. Oh. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to PAX East, Boston. Go Bruins. <laughs> I know. Uh, we're really happy to be up here today to bring you this panel. My name is Garrett Fuller. I work for MMORPG.com. Uh, I am lucky enough to work with these guys all the time. Uh, we really, we've been doing this panel at PAX East since the very first PAX East. Uh, we hope to keep it alive for a very long time, uh, especially with online games. So, without further ado, I'll introduce our panelists. Um, what I want to do is start on this side with Jeremy Gaffney, who's working on Wildstar. It's a very cool sci-fi approach to an MMO. It's really neat. Next is John Peters, who's uh, working on Guild Wars 2. It's only because you're launched. Jack Everett, working on Neverwinter. The hardest part about introducing Dave is I can't really say what he's working on, but Dave Georgeson from SOE for EverQuest. We're just going to leave it at EverQuest. So I, I met Chris Roberts back in uh, October at Austin. And uh, my bosses ended up asking more questions about Star Citizen than I did. But Chris Roberts working on Star Citizen. Some amazing sci-fi stuff out there. Um, the last guy in the panel on the far end asked me to put him on the far end. <laughs> uh, Matt Fire working on Elder Scrolls Online. As well. So with that, we're going to get started with Jeremy, and I know no pressure, Dave, no pressure. Uh, but we're going to ask Jeremy to start talking a little bit about Wildstar and uh, and what the game is about and what the project is working on. We're going to go down the line. Each one of these guys is going to talk a little bit about their project, and then we'll get open it up to fan questions. So go ahead, Jeremy, kick it off. So I'll answer with a short, controlled burst so that we can uh, get on that and answer questions because that's the fun part. Um, Wildstar, you probably know, fantasy, science fiction, MMO. Um, we're trying to do some cool stuff. We're trying to listen to like what Richard Bardo has been talking about for MMO player types, and really give you the ability to choose content based on your play style. We're doing all sorts of cool dynamic stuff with changeable world text. You not only can build houses, but you can build whole battlegrounds to go fight head to head with it. We use this also to update the game as frequently as possible to really try to make a world that feels alive. Um, not, not, and which is probably a good segue over into uh, Guild Wars 2 and what they're doing. Go ahead, John. Uh, hey, I'm John Peters. Uh, I'm working on Guild Wars 2, and like Jeremy said, keeping it short. Uh, it's, for us right now, it's all about live world and you know, keeping the world moving and keeping the world feeling fresh, and uh, I think that's where we're, we're headed. Uh, hi, I'm Jack Emmert. Uh, we are getting really, really, really close with Neverwinter, uh, which is a Dungeons & Dragons uh, MMORPG that is based on the uh, Neverwinter IP, which was popularized by uh, Neverwinter Nights. And uh, its biggest unique feature is the user-generated content. You'll be able to create uh, adventures and quests and full campaigns for your friends and for people all across the world. Give a shout out to Dungeons and Dragons, everybody. I don't think anyone's going to be in this room if it wasn't for Dungeons and Dragons. That's what I would say. I was, I was six. Jack played chainmail. Yeah, he taught me. <laughs> <laughs> That was good. We'll go over to Dave next. But unfortunately, Dave is going to not be able to talk much about EverQuest. So no. I'm gonna, he's going to do his best. I'm Dave Georgeson. I'm the director of development for the EverQuest franchise. So that means EverQuest, EverQuest 2, and the new one that we're building, EverQuest Next. And uh, there's a lot of stuff that we're going into. Uh, EverQuest and EverQuest 2 are both still very alive. We still have full dev teams on them, and they're pushing really hard on figuring out how to tell storyline content to players in ways that we haven't done before. And then EQ Next is hard to talk about. The reveal is August 1st this year. But um, we're re-examining every single element of the MMO, tearing it all the way down to bedrock and rebuilding. Cool. Now, give a shout out to EverQuest. That's another one. Chris, you're 
Chris is in a tough spot because Chris is making star sets. And uh, he also made Wing Commander, for those of you who know that. So I'll let Chris talk a little bit about star sets, which blew us away the first time we saw it. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm creating Star System, which uh, we actually launched, uh, or we announced, uh, last uh, year in October, and um, have uh, been very successful in crowdfunding it so far, which is amazing. Uh, it's the, uh, the highest uh, crowdfunded game in, in dollars uh, today. Uh, and uh, I don't know if any of you played Privateer a long time ago, or maybe played Freelancer, uh, which were two of the games I played back then. But Star Citizen is essentially the game I've wanted to build for the last 20 years, and uh, I always was sort of held back by technology, uh, and uh, I don't feel like that's there anymore, so that's what we're trying to do in Star Citizen. My biggest goal is really to try and build a living world. I talked a long time ago about doing this in Freelancer, and never actually got to sort of see it through, but uh, I wanted uh, a world that reacts all the time to the players, and the players are generating a lot of content, and living their own lives and roles, and there's plenty of things for them to do if you want to be a pirate, you want to be a merchant, you want to be a lawkeeper, you want to be a bounty hunter, you want to be an explorer, you want to be an industrialist, you can do all those sort of things in the realms of space and adventuring around, uh, and do it with a graphical fidelity uh, that uh, is on the cutting edge of uh, PCs, which is sort of what wing commanders used to do in the old days. Uh, and uh, I'm having a lot of fun, and, and I have to say that the thing that's great about being in a, a room uh, you guys is that the thing that's really fun about uh, crowdfunding it is that you sort of have your community be part of the process and they're a fantastic sounding board and a fantastic um, focus group so to speak in terms of determining what's the most important uh, functions inside a, uh, a game and I think it's very similar to what happens in online games once they go live but the difference is if you do it in crowdfunding it's almost like you have that process but before you finish it and it's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun so but it's my First massively uh, multiplayer game, so I'm sort of going to fight next to all these people, but uh, I'll try my best to answer things and not sound uh, uh, inexperienced or I don't know what I'm doing. But there you go. <laughs> so, no pressure on Matt Fiore, he's working on Elder Scrolls. We'll just start with that right there. So, uh, it's a big idea. The, the whole pressure here is going after Chris Roberts because the man made Privateer for God's sake. So, he <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, made Wing Commander, come on. Um, I'm Matt Fireroar, I'm the uh, game director on Elder Scrolls Online. Um, it's a, a game that takes kind of the Elder Scrolls IP that everyone's known and loved forever and uh, making a multiplayer version out of it. So we have a couple of things that we're doing um, uh, that are interesting. One is uh, we're going to have a shardless design, so no more shards, no more servers. You just click play and go, um, which has a lot of technical um, um, coolness associated with it. So. Uh, we're very excited about that. We're also excited about our character development system where you can basically go in and tweak your character the way you want. If you played Skyrim or Oblivion, you get the idea of, of, of the way that system works. So, kind of uh, opening up a little more freedom, a little more social systems, and bringing it into the uh, animal world. Cool. So, with that, um, I'll pose one question and then guys can do just a quick shout out. Sure. Ryan, stand up. Yeah, so Ryan Dancy, stand Ryan up. Ryan Dancy, he's not up here on this panel because we don't have room for him, but uh, he's running Pathfinder on. Those of you speaking of crowdsourcing, uh, so. yeah, yeah, just thought I'd give a shout out. No, no, no. I called Brian out of line because he was like, Brian, come on. So, Pathfinder, how many people in here play Pathfinder? I was a big fan, huge, right? There we go, see? So cool. Let's get the questions set up. Um, what I want to do is I'm going to ask one question to kind of start out. And I started playing online games with Ultima Online back in 97. Uh, I made the leap uh, for a few years later to Dark Age Camelot, which forced me to love PvP. No, no comment, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> My wife and I spent many nights playing Dark Ages. And, uh, and then since Dark Ages, I went on to City of Heroes, uh, Ashran's Call, <laughs> Lord of the Rings Online, Dungeons and Dragons Online. And then I got this job, and I'm now I'm stuck playing everything I can get my hands on. Um, so with that, what I really want to ask you guys first um, is what do you guys see in the next couple of years in terms of online game worlds? I, I almost say, I mean, with MMORPG, almost seeing the concept of a world built, a persistent world built more and more and more. And, uh, and I think it's becoming a big deal for the fans and for players as well. So you can start off, Jeremy, we'll talk about that for a few seconds, and then we'll go right to questions. Yeah, I think actually the panel's a good representation of what we're going to see. The, you're going to 
going to see more dynamic content. You're going to see more user-generated content. You're going to see games coming out that are largely focused on PvP, like uh, Dark Age Unchained has been doing. Um, and there's a reason for that. You know, it takes freaking forever to make a whole bunch of leveling content, um, and people play it once, and then they get bored rapidly. Or you know, I, I think we're seeing an era now where you're going to see a lot more ways of making the game where you're either co-creating with fans or you're going to have dynamic stuff so that you're not seeing you know, the investment in the hundreds and hundreds of hours of content. So I think the games that we have here, for example, maybe even the last era where you start seeing those huge investments in all those hundreds of hours of play, and you start seeing more of you know, what Jack's doing in the Neverwinter Winter Nights, which is letting users get out there and actually make stuff. Well, Tom, do you want to hit something? You, you with Guild Wars right now, you're seeing a lot, so you're out there with everybody. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, uh, I think, you know, we, you see this argument a lot on Garrett's forums. Uh, the uh, sandbox versus theme park games, you know, like, I think we're going to see a lot of more, like, those, not, like, we've seen a lot of, like, AAA, like, really high quality, you know, theme park type of games. And I think, like, like you were saying, Jeremy, that's going to kind of usher an era of more, like, high quality sandbox games. People actually spend time working on that because the, the investment like, just pays itself back because players have a thing that they can kind of do on their own. So, but I also think you're going to see more just online worlds, not just necessarily RPGs, not just necessarily the type of games that we're playing right now. Just, you know, different genres of games and different types of games. And I mean, I've been playing a couple of, like what I would consider almost online world games just on my phone, right? So yeah. it's going to be it's going to be a pretty big, different landscape in a few years. I think, I think you bring up a good point, Jack, when I give it to you, because the Foundry system in Neverwinter really represents how the players can create their own worlds. So yeah, I think that's the next step, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> uh, we, that's exactly what we anticipated by, we actually had user-generated content in our thought process along, for a long time at Cryptic, and uh, when the opportunity to get an IP like Neverwinter uh, came along, it made sense with what our thoughts where the industry might go. Um, I also think that there are two other elements. Um, one is the proliferation of, of different game types into MMOs. We see this with first-person shooters. I mean, Flight Side 2, Firefall, um, there are a number of others. Uh, RTS is, will eventually make its way too. And so a lot of the standard MMORPG tropes aren't going to be quite so true anymore. And I also think globalization is going to be really big. Uh, I'm part of a Chinese company, and they have a ton of MMOs. And they're, they're very successful in the U.S. Uh, I can't give you the numbers, obviously. But I think that that's going to come more and more true. Uh, you're going to be seeing a lot of cross-pollinating. Uh, th that already exists between Korea and America, uh, but not so much between China and America. And I think that that's going to be continuing a lot uh, on, on both sides. It's, it's really, really cool uh, to be there and see it from both sides of the ocean. Dave, what about you? You get, I mean, this is title EverQuest Next alone, and besides Next. So. It, it's very difficult to talk about EQ Next right now because we're supposed to be in a black box. It's kind of a dark gray box now, but it's still <laughs> a black box. Um, yeah, it, well, it's, it's, no, it's no surprise that I'm a fan of sandbox games. Um, I, I built Tribes 2 in the, in the original Planet Side. And um, uh, most of my favorite games have been like Ultima Online and the RVR stuff in Dayok. Uh, it's just fantastic uh, models to use, and most of those, most of the stuff that we've learned from that kind of game has not really been applied to uh, what we think of as a core uh, high fantasy uh, MMO uh, in the past. Uh, certainly not with RPGs, and I think that there's a lot of room to go with that. Um, obviously, we're chasing that a lot. Our, our, our president has mentioned many times that we're building a sandbox game, so that's not a surprise. Um, but one of the really cool things about a sandbox game is that uh, the players can do anything that they want to and uh, go in any path that they want to and be able to uh, pursue the role that they choose to pursue. Um, and that kind of aspect has never been seriously pushed uh, in an MMO, letting people be completely free form and be able to do the things that they want to do. Um, that combined with all the, uh, the, the cloud of peripherals that are starting to surround these games and being able to uh, interact with it, and in fact, uh, the actual uh, uh, physical peripherals on how you interact with a game. Uh, lots of people have heard of Google Glass and everything like that, but those arm wristbands where you can tap your hand and be able to tell exactly which fingers you're using. There's a lot of crazy stuff that will change about how we interact with the games. And all of that stuff uh, 
uh, can be investigated now and extrapolated and planned for in the future. So there's a lot of really cool stuff happening. Chris, you come from a unique perspective building Star Citizen because you're building not only multiple player experiences, big battlegrounds in the galaxy you're going to create, plus exploration, and, and also go into that kind of solo experience as well. So how, how are you bouncing and where do you see things going? Well, I mean, I, I actually, I mean, I think there's going to be a new trend where you're going to see a blend between sort of the single player experience and the multiplayer experience. I mean, you know, Bungie just made a big announcement with Destiny, which is sort of this shared persistent world where it's sort of ostensibly a single player experience that other people can join, which was pretty much, I think, pioneered by Demon Souls back a few years ago on the PS3, which I thought was a fantastic game and was, in, in a lot of ways, some of the things I was doing pretty inspirational because I think you always want to have this balance between a sort of uh, personal experience where you just want to play yourself and then sort of the collaborative um, social experience that you can have when you've got your friends or you want to fight against other players. And, and uh, I think that you're probably gonna, I, I would say that the, for me anyway, as a player, what I'd like to play is a game that is able to sort of do all those seamlessly in the same kind of world so it sort of tailors itself to me. So if I'm a lone wolf, I don't feel like I'm hamstrung, I don't have five people playing with me, but if I have a bunch of friends with me and we can, you know, we can really work that, you know, my game, that trading room really well, or that pirate uh, base really well, then then it is, is beneficial. But, you know, in, in the real world, you can be a lone wolf and be successful, or you can work in a group and be successful. And I think uh, that's probably the challenge, because what in the past, when in any way, the, the MMOs that I've played, it sort of feels like you sort of, you're, you're either in the, you know, you've got to put your group together to really sort of, you know, achieve the quest and, and, and level up properly, or else you're at a big disadvantage, or it's very sort of specific scripted content, and, you know, as, as a panelist alluded down to my right, that's, you, you can never do, you can never create that quick enough for the, the audience you've got. I mean, that's the big, uh, you know, the, the, um, uh, the Old Republic problem is, you know, there's really high quality, but it's, you know, it's the amount of effort that goes into uh, creating those quests is, it takes forever, so. Um, so I, I think there's a balance, and I think then the other thing, uh, is key, which everyone else has alluded to, I mean, I'm not like a rocket science here, is I think you really have to have your uh, community, people that are playing the game have to be actively sort of uh, participating in the creation of content. So, you know, like, um, you know, we don't have Wargame not net here, but they're just a straight PvP, there's no persistence, but they say, we're free to play, not because uh, it's a marketing technique, but the people that are playing for free are actually generating content for us because people that are paying, have someone to play against, and so I think you have to think uh, think sort of differently about uh, the sort of multiplayer experience than say maybe I used to do in the past 10 or 15 years ago when I was building single player games. And it's it's about how to balance those various things and react to um, your the community so they feel like their actions have effects on the world and uh, it means something because that for me is the thing that I'd like to see going forward. I mean that's something I'm focusing on is I want to I want to the world in Star Citizen to feel like it has time, time passes and things happen and you know, your ship gets more worn and beaten up, your character gets more worn and beaten up the more times he has a near-death experience. And you can actually see age and life and, and even people pass on, uh, you, know, you, you know, your character eventually dies and your next of kin comes in or your successor comes in and you have a sense of history uh, that you can build up that the players actually build up in the universe itself. And, that's the kind of world I want to play, so that's sort of what I'm trying to build in Star Citizen. Uh, but I think that a lot of people sort of go to that because it's more sort of, yeah, it's more like a real world, it's just how we get there. Cool. Matt, you, you coming in with, with Elder Scrolls, you're going from a, a really classic single player RPG and opening up that world. I, I actually make the joke that I play Skyrim to relax, I know that sounds silly. Um, but so, I mean, you, what is that like for you going into that, that single solo player that you know, Todd created so well? Now you guys have the online version, so what, what is that like to make the switch? Yeah, when, when you're on panels like this, you get time to think about your perfect answer that you're going to craft, and uh, Chris said exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> 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 I was trying to come back, I mean, everyone, everyone, everyone basically nails it down here, yeah, so. But, uh, yeah. but the, way Garrett, the way Garrett asked the question is actually right, is that um, you can't really force players into a play style anymore. Um, like uh, EQ1, for example, which is an awesome game, but it really forced you into, if you didn't because you couldn't get above a certain level, because you just couldn't, you couldn't do it. And uh, when, you, when you take a game like uh, an IP and, a, and games like uh, Elder Scrolls, like Oblivion and Skyrim, and you take them online, you really have to make sure that you actually give players the experience that, that they're used to, which is, hey, uh, I log in and I can do this.
this thing solo, and then I can go craft the next day, and I can do all these different things. So instead of making a, a game, you're more making a world with lots of little games in it. And one of those games is a solo game, and you want to be sure they can explore the whole territory, and you give them a crafting system where they can make stuff. But that's where the multiplayer stuff comes in, is in Skyrim, you make the stuff and you use it, or you sell it to a shopkeeper. And in, in an ESO, you can make it and sell it to another player, and that's where the whole multiplayer economy comes in. So uh, if, if you want to play ESO like, like you play Skyrim, you could do that, but you have a whole market for your goods if you're a crafter, for example. And that's not forcing anyone into a play style, it's kind of letting people figure out what it is they want to do when they log in and do it. And I think that's kind of a, one of the future aspects of these games, uh, of, the, of the big MMOs, is uh, don't force anyone into anything. Let them figure out how to use their own social networks to do things, and, and let them kind of live in a world instead of forcing something on them. I know, I know our forums are always very happy with the word sandbox. Great Mike, they love it. So. We can't make fun of Star Wars, by the way, because Gabe is sitting over there. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, Joe and Terry, if you guys want to take the mics out to the audience. Guys, listen, we, we talk a lot, and, and I'm lucky enough to see some of these games really early on. We'd love to get you guys to line up right here and go to the mics, and we'll just start taking questions from the audience. It's really about your questions for these guys and where you see online games going. You're the ones who spend hours in the world and playing all the games, so uh, we're happy to take any questions. This is really what the panel, and especially what PAX is all about. So. Just quiet down so everybody can hear the question. So I have a question about kind of opening up the game to giving more control to the players. Um, to anybody on the panel who has a good idea or thought about this, what about the kind of the social constructs that you've built? How control you give to the players or there's people who are, you know, not as well and polite but just want to ruin everyone's game. And a lot of people have been using the control board. Sure. I, I think I think the question is really about kind of players, and it goes back to Ultima, where we had player killers, uh, where I'm trying to convince my son not to be a criminal when we play Ultima sometimes. Um, but uh, it, it's true. Do you guys put checks and balances in the games to realize that there are players out there that kind of you know go after other people and make their experiences poor? And I think they it's gotten come a long way in the last 15 years. But. I can hum a few bars of that. So my background, you know, I founded the Turbine, which did Asheron's Call. So we put in the Allegiant system very specifically, what this was is, before that, newbies were ganked. You know, they were a source of gold pieces for other players and sales to online. Um, and so we put in a system where they were valuable, and the more you helped a newbie, the more benefits you got. You got XP as they earned XP. It was like a little pyramid scheme to go in the level up. And so people treated newbies better. And then I'm working with Jack on City of Heroes. We put in the mentoring system, the sidekick system, so that you could have your low-level buddies actually group with you when you're on higher levels so that you can encourage those social bonds. They're super important. You know, you play the games that your friends play, um, which is a weird tautology, but you know, you do it. So you don't want to play alone. You want to play near your friends, if nothing else, in the same game that they're doing. And so anything that helps social bonding is, is good. We take settlers. Settlers are a socializer path. They can put down a, a campfire anywhere in the world. And the campfire gives a buff to those using. You go to the campfire, you get a strength buff. Well, every time someone uses their campfire, the settler gets settler XP, they get path XP, so they get become better at, you know, earning social rewards. This is a cool puzzle because now, where do you place your campfire where the most people use it? You can't look it up online because if it's online, everybody goes and puts it where they say, oh, I don't put it in the city. Oh, now the city's full of campfires, no one uses them. You have to seek out a place where you can help the most other people in the game and you get rewarded for figuring out the cleverest way to help other people. Like, that's fun game design to do. Like, that's a very interesting sort of puzzle, and it makes the game better, because you have people actually fighting to say, who can, who can I help the most? Go over. Oh, go ahead, Jay. I was actually going to say Okay, about... like, this stuff, like, it's all about how you design the game. Like, you don't have to make it so that, you know, this is the part where, like, we are in control, even though the players are in control of the content. Like, you are giving them the tools, and you don't have to give them the tools to grief each other. And if you give them those tools, they absolutely will. Um, <laughs> like, uh, there's, you know, we spent, you know, what was it, 15 years of MMOs, of, like, mob tagging? Like, we didn't have to have that, and, you know, 
we don't have to have it anymore. And it's all about like figuring out what rules you're going to give them. Like you're not going to give them a sandbox and then just like two knives. In, you know, you know, <laughs> you have to figure out what tools they have and what tools you're going to give them. And building those tools, you can so you're still going to be able to make as like game developers the decisions that create these interactions that are not you know, possible. I was going to say, John, one of the things with Guild Wars 2 for me was the fact that I could fight any monster at any moment, help another player up, and still get XP for it, and they would as well. And I think that shifted my, my gameplay uh, when I started. Terry, you want to go get your questions quick? Uh, yes, I, I just got a question because I'm a little bit worried about uh, Adobe Flash. Um, I wanted to uh, make Flash games in the future and maybe even uh, make a living, or not, well, not really a living, but you know, some money off of it. Um, and I've heard that ever since HTML5 came in, Adobe's been uh, slowly going down the drain. And so I want to know if it's going to be there in the next decade. Who's the techie? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, I would, I'm not a big fan of Flash, I'll tell you that. So I, I would say that Flash I don't think will be the long-term platform you would, you would want for gaming. There's, there's plenty of other good options to do some interesting stuff in. Unity is a very easy uh, system to build inside, um, uh, you know, and you don't really have to be a brilliant programmer or anything to do stuff in Unity. In fact, artists and designers can make great game stuff inside that. There's more powerful engines like Unreal and CryEngine and that kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, Flash, I think, honestly, is going to be a bit limiting, and it has some issues like certain support on mobile platforms and stuff. So, yeah, go ahead. Just to add something, um, I'm, I'm one of the, uh, the the few people that was an idiot enough to try to build an MMO out of Flash. Um, and so uh, I, I, when I was working at Guy Online, we built this big, huge social hub thing. And, and my advice is, um, uh, don't. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I just came from a uh, Wildstar uh, presentation from Jeremy, who at least was a bombshell to me that no matter what MMO you come out with, there's always two or three million people that will buy the game, and then a month later stop playing it. So my question is really simple. How will you, or do you, judge your game to be a success? That's a big, big question. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, first, you know, what, what's the fan reaction like? Uh, second, what are the reviews like? Third, are you paying your bills? I mean, it really comes down to that, right? I mean, it, if a game tracks a million users, Great, right? But in the end of the day, we have devs who spent years making these games. So those are at least my three criteria. Right? Fans like it, how are reviews, how are we making the money? There's a really interesting phenomenon, which is good games, you know, even good games, people churn out. You know, you take a game like World of Warcraft, it's had a super long lifetime. They churn, I don't know the numbers, I don't work there. Um, but it's on the order of 5% of their users turn out maybe a month, you know, 10% depending on the month. And so here's math for you. Here comes the science. What this means is that let's suppose 5% of users turn out a game. That's an excellent rate. That means every 20 months, everybody left. Um, and they've been replaced. You know, you've sold new users, you sold new games, you've recaptured people. But retention is everything. And the awesome thing about our in industry is that good games retain people and bad games in general don't. Um, it, because you can put pretty marketing on a box and sell a bunch of boxes. You know, that's why I made the comment in the last panel. It's not every game does it. You know, Secret World, I don't, I don't think they crossed the you know, million box sales. But games that did, you know, Conan did, Warhammer Online, the, um, Eve has over time, the, the City of Heroes did. City of Heroes did, you know. Most games, you know, can't move a million boxes plus. So there's a million people interested in the game. It's so hard to retain the people who play the game. And the best part is, is that if you have good game design, that leads to retention, which leads to people playing. You know, in our industry, the Will Wrights of the world, the people who make really good game design, I think get rewarded over time. Um, in the box industry, it's not the case. It's often dependent on marketing. It's often dep dependent on, on hype. In the long haul, our industry is not, which I think is strong. And, and I'll add one other thing, at least in my case. Be free to play. It's real simple. The, it, it, look, if you want to play our game, play it. If you don't want to play it, okay. All you did was install a game, you tried it, you didn't like it. And you know what? It's still going to be there. You can come back in three months. There's no barrier to entry. If you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. You can come and go as you want. So that we're not worried about retention. We're just worried about creating a fun game, and you'll come back. 
Because, like Jeremy said, there is this churn. There are people that come and go. That's totally fine, at least from my perspective and what we've learned from Star Trek and Champions, yeah, people come and go. But that's all right. They come back if it's good. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the way I feel on EQ and EQ2 also. I mean, uh, those games have been running for 14 and 9 years, respectively. And uh, the reason why people keep going away and then coming back and going away and coming back is because uh, MMOs are a weird duck. The longer they last, the better they get. Um, it's not like most games. So, um, you know, when you keep a team on it and you continue to build features and you continue to build depth and everything like that, that really shows even when the game engine looks old, the game itself can actually be fantastic. Um, and so uh, we kind of measure success at SOE by how long the, the game lasts and how long uh, the, the fans stick with it and don't fade away. Um, if they go away and come back, that's totally cool. That means you won. That's true. Actually, Jeremy, you mentioned a good point. I wanted to throw it over to Matt, which is you talk about a million box sales. Whereas Matt, you experienced just recently the Facebook boom that ESO had and then got your million likes on Facebook. What's it like now with the social tools? Because you can, you can talk about how that kind of shifted your, your, you know, the way Elder Scrolls was working. Yeah, That's well, we, I mean, you know, with a million Facebook likes, uh, it's apparent that there's a lot of people very interested in the game. Um, you know, you have to worry uh, a lot about day one and making sure the players get in and have a, you know, good, smooth experience when we're talking about that many people hitting the servers all at once. The Star Wars guys can, can attest to that because they had a pretty ginormous uh, first 10-day uh, sale. So, uh, um, you know, so you, yeah. Yeah, and the Sim City guys have some special guys. I just want to point out that he said it, not me. So, uh, but, but, but seriously, you have to design for uh, a big crush of people in the beginning, and then you need to make sure that you have enough content to keep them uh, um, for the long term. You really need to design you know, the game that you want people to play 50 hours, 150 hours, 250 hours. You have to design that up front. You know, you can't just do that after the game launches. You have to make sure that you're launching with a game that people can really get in and play and have fun immediately, and then they kind of understand as they go on kind of how full feature and rich it is, and you keep finding new things and new ways to do things over, over the lifespan of the game. That, that's how you build a long-term community, because we all know uh, games that last longer than, you know, six, eight, ten months and really go big and be successful, it's the community that drives it. It's not about game features. It, 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 there's definitely a, uh, a level that games hit when there's that many people logging in, it just keeps rolling from there. And that's that's actually the target that we're all going for, is making sure you get enough people in there, enough critical mass, and then it kind of goes. Go ahead, Terry. Hi. Um, so City of Heroes has come up quite a bit, and uh, interestingly enough, that's the first major dead end of that I can think of. Um, so I guess it's a little bit of a darker question, but uh, is this kind of what players need to prepare themselves for? Is this inevitable, and how do you guys protect your games, and how far ahead do you plan to keep them around? I don't know. They I'm should say never die. <laughs> <laughs> they should never die. I mean, uh, if, if, if you continue to develop the game, and you continue to feed your fans what they want, and everything like that, you should be able to keep those alive. It's only when something really drastic happens that's business-oriented that, I mean, City of Heroes shouldn't have died, damn it. That was a great game. <laughs> and uh, 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 MMOs are built to last forever. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to play EverQuest in 2050. It's just, it's one of those things. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's just, that's my soapbox, but there's a, there should be no shelf life on these things. So I was an executive producer on the NCSoft side for uh, City Heroes and then the, and I'm gonna strongly agree, I, I don't think we should shut down games, almost ever. I mean, you look at Brian Green's out there, he's got what, Gemstone 3 is still alive, for God's sake, you know, with, uh, plugging away and keeping it with Near Death Studios, which is the best name ever. <laughs> <laughs> the, there's no reason, there's no reason not to keep them alive, or when there are reasons, it's on the business side. And so even as an NCSOP employee, I'll... Uh, I'll tell you what, okay. Jeremy, just tell anybody at NCSOP, pick up the phone, I'm there. So anyone want to step out City Heroes, give me a I'll say on my side that uh, you know, I think there are there's several things that you can do. I mean, obviously it becomes more difficult when you're part of a much bigger company because there's a whole different sort of cost structure which makes the expenses. Uh, it just, it's, you know, if, if you're a big company, you just have more expenses and therefore the cost of running it. And generally it's always about is uh, the game bringing in enough money to at least cover its uh, outgoing costs. Uh, but I mean, there's some other things you can do. So like we are trying on Star Citizen, we, you know, we did on 
freelance uh, have the ability for people to run their own servers and host it. It's not going to be as big as, say, the full persistent universe, but you'll certainly be able to host a server and have you know, 100, 200 people play in your universal world. And in that case, yeah, you know, the game's always going to be there for you. I mean, it, and I have to say that freelance is a really great example of this. I mean, the game shipped in 2003, and there is still a very uh, large and strong active base playing it, running their own servers, and Microsoft stopped supporting it essentially in 2003 or four because they were focusing on the Xbox and that was what they really cared about. Uh, but the users have kept freelance going. You can still go there and you can go to all the different modding pages. And a lot of them are all in Germany, but there's ones here in the US too. And yeah, they're running servers and there's different servers you can go to. So I think if you can provide some tools for um, your community in the way that maybe they can take off some of the load, that would definitely help. And then the other thing is just figuring out a way that your infrastructure costs are cheap enough that it makes it economically valuable to run it. So I think everybody probably at this point, I mean, I know I am, and I'm pretty sure everyone else is figuring out, hey, how can we do this so it's more scalable, we can bring it up and down quickly, we don't have these huge dedicated uh, data centers that cost us a lot of money. So, you know, I'm you know, definitely looking at sort of more cloud-based um, solutions in some cases because that allows you to sort of scale up and down occasionally. But all those things. So, but I think definitely I mean, your goal should be this universe should live forever. And that's the whole idea of it. Thanks, it's a tough question, <laughs> but it was a good one. Go ahead, Jim. Gentlemen, what do you think the, uh, the use of mobile devices in the creation of your games outside of just microtransactions? That's another that's really good one. It's huge. It's, yeah, right. <laughs> it's, it's creating integrated game experience so that no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, you can feel part of your game. So, for instance, Wildstorm. Um, being able to, from my mobile phone, for, what did you call the class? Settler. If there were mechanics for my settler that my mobile phone could, I could do, whether it's mini games or even something with my character, so I could progress my settler path. So that even, I don't know about you guys, but if I'm not at a PC as much as I was you know, 10 years ago, um, but I am near my iPad, my iPhone, and it's much easier to log in and do it. So I, I, I think somebody said it very simply it's the future. To what degree it is, for instance, whether it's attached to the game or whether it's like ordering chaos, where it, it, it like you are literally playing on on an iPad. Um, that's up to debate. But I, I completely agree. That's the future. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to take the total contrarian view because I. I mean, I, obviously, the, this is where things are going. But uh, I find it amusing. And I say this all the time that uh, you know Macintosh's first shift with a nine-inch screen, and then they spent. 20 years evolving to cool 27-inch screens, and now we have to go back to a 10-inch screen. You know, so it's like, uh, you know, uh, I like the big screens. Uh, when we you know when the next round of mobile devices comes out, then you can actually plug, you know, you can actually use the tablet and plug in to so you get a nice big. Uh, that's that's when things really going to blow up because that's when you can take it with you, you can play it small, you can play it. Big. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I definitely think for the high-end sort of uh, game. Uh, Sort of the mobile devices aren't there yet, but they certainly are going to be sort of complementary, you know, like you know, saying you, you advance a certain mechanic, or you know, in the case of Star Citizen, you can check it and see what the stock market's doing, all that kind of stuff. A uh, set of missions that you can fly once against a computer. Uh, but I do think long term, what will happen is there will be basically a tablet like PC that when you walk into your yeah. living room, it will connect wirelessly to your. TV and controller, and you can sit and play sort of more console experience. You go into your office, it will connect wirelessly to your monitor and keyboard, and you'll do this. And that, and that will be the future, but it's a ways off just because of performance issues and heat issues. And uh, you know, there is a reason why there's a PC, you know, high end gaming rig is this big and has, you know, power, you know, power units that draw, you know, 850, 1000 watts and require a huge amount of cooling. It's just because graphics power and CPU power like that uh, requires some power and cooling, and you just couldn't put it. Small form factor at the moment, but you know, ten years ago things were very different. I mean, yeah, the my iPhone is a lot more powerful than the five thousand dollar PC you used to have to play Wake Command on. So, uh, so you know, maybe what I'm suggesting will come sooner than I think it will. But in the foreseeable future, I think in the next three, four, or five years, you know, still PCs will be sort of the highest end of the gaming. But I think the mobile side and the tablet side definitely is going to catch up, and you're going to start to see it complementing the gameplay. And then maybe it can be either one. See, we wouldn't have all those fan sites out there if people didn't want to stay connected to their game all the time. 
So these, this is just another way to get them even more involved when they're not there. I mean, everybody wants to know what's going on, if there's a raid printing going on, or if there's marketplace stuff going on, or whatever it is. Everybody wants that stuff all the time. And the more that you can interact with it, the better it is. So yeah, I mean, we're still making PC games, and we're still using those as the main hub, and that's all. That's going to be part of it for a long time. But uh, yeah, this other stuff is going to add in fast, fast, really. I think so. I, I think a great example of that was, uh, was John, you guys did a patch one day, and, uh, and Guild Wars 2 was, I think, down for a very short period of time, and our forums just exploded at MMO, made Mike's head ache for a while as community manager. But it, it's, it's the type of thing where you, either you're playing the game, you're logged into the game. One of the coolest features uh, a while back was, was the idea that the cell phone would call you and tell you stuff was getting done in the game. I know Destiny kind of showed a little bit of it. Um, I know the agency, which was a so he was working on, they, they had a spy network, and you you would actually get phone calls from the spy network. Yeah, who remembers Majestic? The most yeah, American yeah. time game ever. Yes, <laughs> yeah. A game about terrorism right before 9-11. That yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the game with some right. emails and faxes and stuff. I mean, yeah, by like our little events happening in the world, that was well done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. It didn't take it. So, uh, cool. Go ahead. Uh, in Final Fantasy 11 and 14, you can level every class on just one character. Why don't more of them? That's a really good question. <laughs> Actually, the answer is pretty simple. It's because we, either through sheer stupidity or through the data we saw, is that players play to play with other players. They play with their friends. And actually, Jeremy was the one who tutored me on this, really. And that is, if, if a single character is capable of leveling up in everything, then he doesn't need anyone else. And the minute he doesn't need anyone else, he's not going to play with anyone else. If he doesn't play with anybody else, well, he's not going to play. And that was what we thought. Now, I don't think that's necessarily true, but in, in our defense, 10 years ago, I would say that was pretty proud. Um, that, that thing. Yeah, we're on, on Dark Scrolls Online, uh, obviously, it's uh, got some class-based elements, but you can learn, uh, you know, the vast majority of skill lines and abilities, any, any class can learn, a lot of them you have to go out in the world and find, and you're not, you're only limited by the number of skill points that you want to put into it, but you can also go out in the world and find extra skill points, so, um, which is why when you get to the level cap, which is 50, you can still go on learning new abilities and putting, uh, you know, assigning things to them, and you can eventually, if you put enough time into it, you know, you can't do all of them all, but you great majority of, uh, of the abilities. You know, if you put in that time in Skyrim, you'll know exactly what, what the system's on. So, um, the big problem with that, and, and Jack was kind of skirting around the issue, is that it's hard as hell to balance that. Uh, so, yeah. uh, <laughs> so uh, you know, if, if, if you can do any, if you let the players do anything, they will do anything. So, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to put some constraints on it, especially in PvP-based games, which most of them have some kind of PvP component. You don't want, uh, Basically, uh, the first time a player finds something that's 1% more powerful in a build, 98% of your players will be that build within like four days. So, uh, you know, <laughs> you, you have to make sure that doesn't happen because everyone wants to win. So that's why there's constraints. But, you know, you want to give the players some freedom inside of those constraints so they don't feel like, you know, I'm the same as everyone else and those designers suck and, you know, so forth. And I think it's a little more basic than that, too. Like, there's another fundamental thing. Like, for us, I can tell you exactly why we do it. One of the important decisions you make, and decisions you make need to be permanent sometimes, is your character. And then, like, this is a role-playing game. Like, it's like, at least for me, what's fun about, like, D&D is not, like, always min-maxing and eventually just, like, killing everything, right? It's, like, the role-playing, and you can't play a role if you can play every role. Um, so, there's literally the reason why we did it in Guild Wars 2 is, like, we want you to think, like, this guy, this is my warrior, like, what is his story, he likes to kill rabbits with axes, like, whatever it is, whatever that character is, like, that's an important part of your character, that's why there have to be permanents, and, you know, so it's, like, one of the best, most clear permanent decisions that you can give players. Uh, so I'll just, because I have an interesting perspective on this, because I'm pretty contrary to all this, I actually think that, uh, where, you know, you should be able to choose whatever profession you want to do, and, and how you uh, how you perform in your profession will sort of indicate whether you want to, you know, if I'm not particularly good at dogfighting, I probably, in my in Star Citizen's case, I probably do not want to uh, be a mercenary or a bounty hunter. Maybe I want to be a merchant or a trader. 
but I'm not prevented, even if I'm a really bad dogfighter, from taking some bounty hunter missions and, and doing that. And I actually, uh, actually, that's one of the immersion breaking things for me, to be honest with you, is, I mean, I know we're talking role playing, but I think that as a person, I should say, okay, you know, I want to try and, and uh, take this combat role, or I want to try and take this merchant passive role. And I, and I think there's, there's not particularly, uh, 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 I think the, uh, let me say, I'm not going to say there isn't a good reason not to do it, because I, I want to be particularly fed by one that knows a lot more about MMO games than me, but I'm certainly going to try to make it be more professional based, and you basically take the jobs, and you'll, I feel you'll sort of gravitate to the play style that will be applicable to you, but if you want to sort of switch halfway in, you're a mercenary, and now you decide you want to be a pirate, great, you can be a pirate, or now you decide you want to hang up your, um, you know, dogfighting shoes and become a merchant, and you can do that. Um, but I, I actually like the ability to have that freedom, and I find it, it breaks the immersion for me if, I, if I'm sort of, I'm a warrior, and I have to be a warrior, and I can never change it. But that's just my pet down with me. I, I agree with Chris. Um, let's say I have a character that I really, really like, and I've, I've named him, and I, I wrote a background for him, and I figured out what he looks like, and I decorated his house, and all this other stuff. Um, I don't feel like I should have to be relegated to a single class. I don't feel like that that's a restriction that needs to happen. Um, and I do believe that there are ways to balance the game uh, to be able to let you have more choice. Because ultimately, this is a role-playing game, and you should be able to play the role that you want to play um, without necessarily having to recreate another character, in my opinion. Um, and I, I think that there's a lot of ways we can go down those paths so that they're really interesting and very cool for the players, and, uh, and we'll be pushing that a lot farther. <laughs> Go ahead, Joe. We're running, we're running a little short on time, and we got a few minutes left, so we'll try to do questions as quickly as we can. Okay, I just wanted to say, I have to, I have to say, I really enjoyed hearing everybody well, Ultima Online. I still play to this day. So my question comes as, um, how do you feel about Shroud of the Avatar and how he's approaching um, multiplayer with that? Well, see, by count, on this panel are at least four designers who've worked with Richard in some fashion. I think Richard said that. Every designer he worked with was lazy. <laughs> I, I, I know he actually said I was good, but other than that... <laughs> Richard, Richard doesn't know me, so I'm okay. <laughs> if Richard said lazy and a jerk, then I know he was talking about me. But... <laughs> I'm having lunch with Richard on Wednesday down in San Francisco, so now I'm going to get nervous when he says, Hey, the panel, what happened? I say, hey, about that comment. I'm definitely going to play that game. I don't think anybody up here is even going to play that game because we all grew up with those games. Yeah. I mean, geez, Ultima 4, are you kidding me? Yeah, 4 for the oh, And I, and I, and I, I mean, I'll, in slightly in Rich's defense, I think he was trying to make a valid point and didn't make it very well. Um, he was trying to sort of be uh, a sensationalist in a statement to a journalist and didn't and wasn't realizing that that's the, what the headline was going to be. Uh, but uh, he was just sort of trying to make the point, which is true, by the way. And this isn't, uh, this isn't exclusive to video games. This is, this is for every sort of entertainment collaborative medium. I mean, most of the people that make movies aren't particularly, I mean, it's, you know, when, how many times do you see a really great movie? How many times do you play a really great game? How many times do you listen to a really great record? And, you know, 100% you, of the people making movies making records can't be all brilliant. So there's some people that do good jobs and there's some people that aren't quite so good and some people in the middle, but there's a lot of talent all through our industry at all the levels. And I think Richard was unfortunately trying to make a point that the designing side of it really doesn't have a great structure in terms of learning how to do it. You can go to school to learn how to program and do art much easier than you can game design because game design is very sort of nebulous and there's lots of features and functions and, and there's also several levels of game design so there's the sort of I'm designing the overall game and the big vision of it and then there's designing the elements like you're designing levels or missions and, or designing a combat system and that sort of small piece to go into a hole and and, uh, and and in general when Richard was referring to people coming out of QA and doing stuff it was more on the more like first getting into the business so there are definitely when you play a game, you play a game, and you go, okay, hey, uh, I can do it better. It's like I watched a movie or I watched a TV show, and I can I can do that better. But there's a there's a lot of work that gets to making it, and so it just takes time. And so our industry definitely needs a place where we invest more in how people learn how 
design and build games and we nurture it because it's really kind of not very well defined. And he was trying to make that point and he made it in an incredibly inelegant way because there's a huge amount of talented people in this business, um, all in this panel and all the rest are I meet and uh, everyone has great ideas and, and uh, if anyone is in game design, you will know that you cannot be lazy making games. It's, it's, a, it's a, you know, a lot of times it can be six, seven days a week and 16 hours a day, so that is not my definition of lazy, so big No, it's true. Actually, but just to bring it back to Ultimate real quick, for, for me personally playing games, I grew up on Atari and Dungeons and Dragons. I got to Ultimate Online. I could never go back. I had to play an MMO every time they came out. And I think it's that it, it shapes your consciousness as, as a player and as, and as these guys as developers. You, once you see something done a certain way, that's it. It, it. Things don't go back. For me personally, I think Guild Wars 2 did that too. I think that some of the design concepts they had and some of the ways they did things, it, I could never go back. And, uh, and I think you've seen those tears in every, in every genre we've all worked in, from Ultima to Dark Ages to, to City Heroes to, um, you know, to, to now, which we're, we're getting into with you know, the funding like Star Citizen and, and uh, Neverwinter, the, the combat mechanics you're starting to see come into MMOs. So for me, it's, it really does shape your consciousness on how things go. And, and like I said, once you see something really new that, that hits you, an ultimate is that for me. So uh, definitely change. Go ahead. Retention is uh, really important in the design for online gaming, obviously. Um, and there needs to be reasons for the players to log in as often as possible. But something that always annoys me in the game is when I feel if I spend three days uh, off that patch or whatever, I'm suddenly three days behind on the competitive edge. Should the player who plays one day every day for a week be rewarded more than the player who puts seven hours on the weekend? Well, that's a good question. We can be that old. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did everyone hear? Did everyone hear what he said? He said it, it's tough sometimes, as, especially with MMOs that you play them. If if you go on a vacation for two weeks, you're suddenly lost in the shuffle. Your guild is ten levels ahead of you, and they're raiding bosses, and they're like, "Not you." So, I I think number one, if it gets to those mobile peripheries we talked about, so that. If ideally you can connect into your game and continue those activities, that's great, but I think there's actually a second question, and that is, should the person who plays one hour a day, every day, be any worse off than somebody who plays one day for seven hours? And I'll just say no. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And in fact, Jack did it the best of anybody so far. Uh, the, the CD Hero stuff for, for being able to play with anybody at any time was the best in the industry. And don't forget, I had Jeremy's help. It was fantastic. Yeah. Got my point going. <laughs> do we want to do a speed round of as fast answers as possible? Or? Do as quick as we can. We'll do two minutes of speed round, so go ahead. Um, first, Jeremy, uh, the news that you found, Richard Ryan, you did a lot of support with Ashron's call. Thank you. Uh, so that's probably the best MO I've ever played. In relation to that, um, I've heard about other scrolls online saying, oh, you can be a battle mage, whatever. That triggered that, because that's what all Ashron's call is about, is being doing anything you want. Um, a lot of games have made that claim. How can you design that to really fit around the players and say, okay, well, yes, you can do everything, but you know, this isn't you know, this isn't nerfed, this isn't too powerful. How do you balance that? Uh, I think the oh. statement I think the statement is uh, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. So you, you have to look at it that way. You give the player the freedom, but the freedom sometimes involves making A B choices where they can't get something and they choose something else. So you limit it by letting them choose how they're limiting themselves by their own choices. And that, that's how you do it. Cool. Go ahead. Um, you've all brought up user generated content to some extent, but since this is the future of online games, is user generated content the future? Will developers bother writing content for their games? Will they just package their game and a foundry? So I think that you know, what you'll find is that uh, the future of the online games is the past of online games in many ways. I mean, we're all probably old school anyway, so it's part of that. Um, the reason why, um, in my day, the reason you almost plunked out of college was LP muds, you know? Show of hands, anyone who knows what the word LP mud is? Yeah, old school. The, um, and LP muds were text-based MMOs that got as huge as 100 concurrent users. Um, and the reward for getting really high level was often being given the ability to go make stuff in the game and go make the set, next set of rooms and become a, mo a mod and an admin. And so it's only because MMOs are so damn slow to make that we are seeing our generation, I think, really hitting that now. But you know, that was true in literally the late 80s. You were seeing that kind of stuff. So yes, I think it's the future, but it's also the past. 
We need we need a we need a big hit uh, UGC thing because uh, right now you, you'd be kind of insane to just put out a UGC product that's only UGC. You need professional content to go along with it. But but in the near future, people are going to get real good at that stuff, and they're not necessarily going to be working at the company. And then the possibilities open up. If we're talking about the future, yeah, UGC will only get stronger, not weaker. So sort of a tag along. How do you really incentivize good user? Good, you can use it. Oh, yeah. great. Just out, out the thread, but, so, hit the, what we're going to try and do in Star Citizen, because I, you know, I, I'm a big fan of the modding community, as I said, that's how I brought free, free lines from life, so on, is uh, obviously if you're running your own server, you can do whatever you want with modding, but inside the universe we're building, we need to curate it, because you've got to make sure that it fits inside the dynamics of the universe and doesn't unbalance things and the rest of them. So, but we're, what we're going to do is, sort of almost run it like, say, you're the uh, US government, like putting out a contract for a new tank, or in our case, a new spaceship, or a new weapon. And we put it out to the community and we say, here are the specs, this is what it's going to be, give us your designs, and then the community will uh, essentially vote on the designs they like the best, and the winners of that design will go into the game, and will be sold in some of the shops in the game, and the revenue from those shops will be split with the users that design them. So that's kind of how we're thinking of incentivizing you know, we're already seeing it, even on, you know, we're almost two years out from uh, being um, you know, a fully live game. We were first in the project before that two years ago. But um, we already have users that are building spaceships and designing white and, and by the way, it's like high grade, professional, beautiful 3D art, and incredibly impressive, uh, impressive. So I think definitely user generated content is a big part of sort of sandbox uh, multiplayer experiences. And that's the hardest question in online games. Whoever solves that properly will make trillions of dollars. So, <laughs> real simple how we're handling it in uh, Neverwinter. Look at YouTube, right? Just ranking things and people liking it and so forth. That's number one. The best will rise to the top. Number two, if you like, like something that somebody created, you get to tip them with in-game currency. So, that person can use that in-game currency to buy the same elite gear that somebody doing, run, doing dungeon runs has. I mean, even pretty sure this is actually an MMO at this point. Team Fortress 2. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the game is already doing this, right? So. Yeah, well, we're doing it in EQ and EQ2 with uh, Player Studio already, too. So players are already making assets, like, you know, cloaks and swords and stuff like that, and, and selling it to each other through the shop. Through the shop. Uh, that's the tip of the iceberg stuff. Guys, listen, i got to shut the panel down again. I know it's, it's terrible. So, listen, no, guys, no, no, yeah, just definitely check out the games on the show floor. Yeah, come up and ask us questions. I think most of us can yeah, be around. We'll, we'll be here for a few minutes. And uh, I, I can't thank Jeremy, John, Jack, James, Chris, Woo! Jack. Yeah. 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 So, come to MMORPG and check us out. And thanks again, guys. The panel was great.